We live in a day and we live in a time unlike any other in human history. We have access to more information than we ever had before. If it's not published already, then AI can generate it for you immediately and instantly. We live in a day and an age that the sheer volume of information that we have is completely mind-blowing. If you ask somebody who lives outside of the state of California, tell me something about San Juan Capistrano, the overwhelming majority of people wouldn't even know that our city exists, let alone that we're home to the number three donut in the entire nation. Anybody excited about J.D. Flannel being in our town in Jesus' name? But yet, if you were to Google San Juan Capistrano, California, in 0.43 seconds, you would have over 19 million results instantly. You don't even have to have a supercomputer to have this. You, you, you have it at the palm of your hands. Uh, you have it uh, wearing it on your wrist. We have at our fingertips more information and more access than ever before. If you want to know what's happening right now across the globe, all you have to do is pull up a device, turn on a screen, ask one of your devices, Alexa, what's going on right now across the globe? Hey, Siri, hey, Google, uh, what's happening in the news around us and instantly in any language with any accent they will tell you exactly what you need to know now before you think that today i'm going on a witch hunt against all things technology and all things social media and television please hear me loud and clear today that i'm not saying that these things are evil i think far too often in churches we call something evil that is actually just a, a, a tool uh, that can be used and, and has a whole lot of great power to wield. But what, what I am going to suggest today is that our minds, our hearts, our souls were not meant to carry all of the things that we carry. Could it be that the things that most consume us are the things that could absolutely destroy us. Our lives today are more noisy, are more distracted, more inundated, more busy and more full than they ever have been before. And yet at the same time, we are less, we have less time. We're less flexible with less margin in our life. We're busier than we ever have been before. We've got more access than we've ever had. We're more informed than ever before with more opportunities than we've ever had. And yet, if we were to do a state of the union of our own heart and our own soul, we still feel empty. We still feel tired. Uh, we still go through seasons where we feel lonely. We're afraid. We're depressed. We've got anxiety that's crippling us in every aspect of our life. Make no mistake, what we are consuming is not contributing to our health and our well-being. We've got our work life. Uh, we've got our home life, our personal life, with our relationships, with our kids, with our friends, with our spouse. We've got our spiritual life, our physical life, our financial life. We've got our emotional life, and we work, and we try, and we attempt in our life to have a balance all throughout our life. The only problem is, Jesus says, this is actually not the way that life was designed to work. In arguably one of his most famous sermons ever preached. In the longest sermon that we have recorded in the New Testament, a sermon that we're going to spend the entire summer walking verse by verse through, in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addresses this very thing. He talks about what life ought to look like. He talks about what the good life looks like, covers a whole lot of territory, and in the very middle, in the center, in the heart of this sermon... Jesus says this, you're worried about all of these things. Uh, there are all of these things that are consuming your mind that you're so concerned about. 
You're trying to balance and you're trying to manage all of these pieces, spinning all of these different plates. And yet, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus makes this really simple, which is something that he does all throughout his ministry, which means for you and for me, if we ever hear anybody, if we ever experience anyone telling us a way of following Jesus that's complicated, it's just not the way of Jesus. Because Jesus says, if we just take care of our spiritual health, if we focus on following him, our souls and our hearts out of our souls and our hearts will flow good and right decisions. I'm not talking about circumstances, uh, that if you just make the right spiritual decisions that your circumstances will somehow magically and spiritually transform into the perfect circumstances of your life. No, I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that as we prioritize pursuing Christ, our heart and soul will begin to come into alignment with his life. Our souls will uh, begin to be in that good place. There are in our day and in our culture today, if you were to go to a bookstore, if those even exist anymore, there are all kinds of books on dieting. There's all kinds of videos on, uh, on getting healthy and working out and, and exercising. You can click on any social media post to learn how to do a a full body cleanse or a detox and how to care for your body, but yet there's very little talk about how to care for your soul. And so in this series over the next five weeks that we're calling Soul Detox, our hope is that we're gonna go on a journey where we find health for our heart and our soul. And we're gonna go on a journey that's gonna be some of the longest journey that you've ever taken in your life. It's this 18 inch journey from your head to your heart. And it's the most important journey that you can take as a follower of Jesus from what we know to then how we live. And here's why it's important. Here's why we can't miss this journey. Here's why we can't just avoid taking this 18-inch journey because life works from the inside out, not from the outside in. Now, if you think about it like that, that life works from the inside out, uh, here's what I'm talking about. Our perspective shapes our thoughts. How we view things shapes how we think about things. Then... How we think about things shapes how we act about things. You act in a certain way over a certain period of time, then habits are created, and how we act and how we behave create habits in our life. And the habits of our life become the character that defines and describes our life. What we continually do is how we are continuously characterized. And our character leads to a destination, this sum total of the choices that we make in life. And here's what I want you to know today, church, that Jesus is not interested in just changing your eternity. He is interested in shaping your life here and now. Jesus doesn't just impact the spiritual side of our life, the religious realm of our life. No, Jesus shapes our whole life because... Jesus is interested in your entire life, not just our spiritual life. And to unpack this, I want to ask you a very simple question. The question is this, how is your soul? Now, for the men in the room, I'm asking this question to you, not just the ladies, because men, as it turns out, in fact, we do have emotions and feelings, and we do too have a soul. But I want to ask you this morning, really, honestly, how are you doing? How are you doing today? How's your soul? I remember the first time that I went to Kara's hometown. Uh, We were dating probably a month, month and a half, two months. And uh, she's like, okay, it's time that you probably meet my parents. And so I picked her up and uh, we, we took a road trip together up to Pennsylvania. Kara is from Somerset County, Pennsylvania. This is like small town, small town. If you remember back on September 11th, 
Somerset County is where Flight 93 went down, and she is, that is her hometown. But Kara's from an even smaller part of a really small county in, in Pennsylvania. She is from the township of Upper Turkey Foot. <laughs> you can't make this up. True story. And if there's an Upper Turkey Foot, that means there's a Lower Turkey Foot, too. And so she's from Upper Turkey Foot, and I remember driving to meet her parents for the very first time. And we're driving into town. As we get close, we turn on the local radio. And I kid you not, they had a local traffic report for Somerset County, Pennsylvania. We're driving in, and it's like, yep, there's no traffic all throughout Somerset County. Driving west into downtown is completely clear. There are no traffic jams, no accidents to report. Back to you, Bob. This is, the, this is the small town traffic report that I'm like, why do we even need this? But yet, if we're asked about the traffic and the traffic report of our own heart and our own life, how often do we respond? Yeah, everything's fine, everything's clear. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Busy, but good. Really? How are you really doing? Because honestly, if we were to really reflect on this traffic that goes in and out of our own heart on a daily basis, maybe we'd say, you know what, honestly, Brandon, I'm tired. I'm struggling. I'm exhausted. I feel the burnout. I feel like I just can't, I can't keep up. I feel like I'm carrying so many things in the weight of the world. I feel like I'm just always trying to play catch up. Like, will I always be behind in life? Do you know how you're in need. You wanna know how you can know that you're in need of a soul detox? There's a few ways. Have you, have you lost the passion in your life? Has passion faded in your life? Have you gotten to a place where you don't feel the highs or the lows of life? You're just kind of walking through life feeling numb. Have you gotten to a place where small things become big things in your life? Where little things make you really emotional, where, where sleep and rest and naps, vacations and time off don't refuel you in the ways that you need. Maybe it's just because you're worried. Maybe you're anxious or you're bitter or you're depressed or you just feel hurried all the time. Can I just remind you, it's okay to not be okay. And here, we're, we're this safe space, home for the wanderer and rest for the weary. It's okay at Mountain View Church to not be okay. Struggling with your mental health doesn't mean you're not a good Christian. It just means you're human with a pulse. So how in the world, in this world that we live in, how do we care for our souls? Uh, let me just lay the foundation that caring for our souls is not hocus pocus. It's about focus. Caring for your soul, caring for yourself, caring for your own heart and your own soul isn't about some magical sayings or new age philosophy or superhero spirituality. It's about focus, not about hocus pocus. And in order to focus our hearts and our minds, I want us to take a step back to the Old Testament book of Psalms. It's, a, it's an entire book of songs and worship. And worship has a way of recentering our heart and our life. It's a chance for us to worship instead of worrying. It's a chance for us to choose faith over living in fear. And so if you've got your Bibles with you, I wanna invite you to turn over to Psalm chapter 46, where the psalmist writes this in verse 10. Psalm 46, 10 says, "'Be still and know that I am God.'" I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. This is one of those passages that is pretty well known. Maybe you've heard this passage before, but I believe that this passage is a prescription for the restless and weary soul. God is speaking to his people in this moment through this psalm who are people in the middle of turbulent times. They're being attacked. They're being persecuted. People are literally robbing them blind. Political systems are crumbling. Wars are breaking out. I wish we could find a more relevant time 
for us to talk about. And into this moment, God speaks to his people, and he's got two words. In the midst of all of this chaos, in the midst of all of the crazy, God's got two words to say to us, and it's this, be still. In the Hebrew, it literally translates, close your mouth, keep calm. You've probably seen those shirts, you've probably seen those stickers, you've probably seen those memes, keep calm and carry on. This is literally God saying that to us as his people. Keep calm and remember that you can trust me. Keep calm and remember that I, God, your heavenly father, I always win. God literally says, spoiler alert, I'm still gonna be exalted. I'm still gonna be on the throne. When you're overwhelmed, I'm still on the throne. When your world is crashing down around you, oh yeah, I'm still on the throne. When your marriage feels like it's spiraling out of control and there's no connection anymore in that relationship, oh yeah, God is still on the throne. What does that tell you and me? It tells us that no matter what happens, no matter what goes down, no matter what the stock market does, no matter what your employer says, can I go further? No matter who wins the election in November, God's still going to be on the throne. It doesn't matter if we've got a toilet paper shortage. It doesn't matter if there's a lumber shortage, a coin shortage, or a sriracha shortage. God is still in control, and he's still good. Translation, keep calm and trust God, because he's still God in the worst of times, just like he is in the best of times. Be still and know that I am God. Not sit still, not become a statue, No, he's just reminding us to take a deep breath, to quiet our souls, and calm down. So if you're feeling anxious, it's just signaling to you that you need to slow down your circumstances to focus on your Savior. If you're feeling anxious, it's just signaling that you've got to quit focusing on your circumstances so that you can start focusing on your Savior. How do we calm our soul Let me tell you this, our soul cannot find peace in a hurry. Love has a speed, and it's a whole lot slower than we're going. We just need to slow down our life to know what fuels us and what replenishes us and what refreshes us. For me, what refuels and replenishes is working with my hands. In my line of work as a pastor, I work extensively with my mind and with my heart. And so I rest differently, and I rest with my hands. Every time I go to visit family, uh, my, my grandparents, uh, I'll go and see them. And my grandfather's a farmer. He's been a farmer his entire life. He came from a farming family. And so as you can imagine, his hands, he's working with his hands all the time, which means they're rough, it means they're tough, it means they're strong. And every time I go and hug him, he always takes me by the hands and says, These are the hands of a pastor, not a farmer. (laughs) And so as I work extensively with my mind and my heart, I rest well and rest best with my hands. And so you gotta answer the question, what is it that refuels you? If you really slow down, what can I slow down and do and experience that's actually gonna refresh me? Maybe for some of you, you gotta take a walk. Maybe for some of you, you gotta take a hike. Literally, not, not figuratively, like take a hike. Some of you need to get on a bicycle. Some of you need to go and buy a Lego set and build it and just get lost in the moment of creating and engineering. Some of you should need to listen to some music and, and mow the lawn and slow down. What are your hobbies in life? What do you do just for you? For me, I love fountain pens. And before you are like, oh, what a nerd. Let me beat you to the punch. Yes, I am a nerd. And that's fine. Jesus loves me. But I love to write with fountain pens. I love to clean them. I love to tinker with them. I love to repair them. If you've got a fountain pen at home that's been in a drawer for 100 years, Uncle Brandon can fix it for you. I got you. But this is what I do. What can you do that helps your soul become still? Can I tell you it doesn't happen by accident? It happens intentionally. So schedule 
that time. Well, pastor, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Listen to me. Everybody look here. You don't have to do religious things to care for your soul. You don't have to read all kinds of books. You don't have to go to all kinds of confessions and pour hours and hours into prayer. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Come on, somebody. I heard it said, oh, now y'all are getting turned up. I heard it said, and I don't know whether it's true or not, that 70% of discipleship is a good night's sleep. Sometimes the most godly thing we can do is rest. And we got to quit saying, oh, I hope my soul gets better. I hope I can care for my soul. Listen, hope is not a strategy. Calendar it. Put it on your calendar. Take some time for yourself so that your soul can begin to calm down. If you're anything like me, if it ain't on the calendar, it ain't happening. Calendar it. Let me, let me give you three things to focus on. Focus on priorities. Focus on rhythm and focus on schedule. What matters most to you? These are your priorities. What matters most to you in life? For me, it's my relationship with God. It's my relationship with my wife, Kara, and then my relationship with our kids. And then there's a whole lot of other things under that. Wait, wait, you're our pastor, you don't care about us? Yes, I care about you. I just care about my family more. Uh, You want that from your pastor. I want that for you. I want you to care more about your family than you do about your career. I want you to begin to get into alignment with your priorities in life. And as you figure out your priorities, create rhythms and schedules based on your priorities, not based on everybody else's priorities. Here's what I want you to know. You cannot pour from an empty cup. Don't give your priorities your leftovers. What are some things that fill you up so that you can love the most important people in your life well? Psalmist says to be still. But if we just stopped here with this phrase, be still, uh, then we might as well be Buddhists. But we're not Buddhists, we're believers in Jesus. And so the passage goes on, be still and know God. Listen, God isn't gonna give us some Uh, empty rituals to follow. It's just not who he is. God is inviting us to trust him with our life. Trust me. One of the greatest things that you and I can do to care for our soul is to constantly fill our minds with the truth. You want to change your life? You want to change your thinking? You want to change the way that you think? Start spending time pouring goodness from God into your mind and into your heart. You may just struggle with worry. You may really want to care well for your heart and your soul, but you just worry all the time, or you just worry some of the time, or you've worried at one point in time in your life. If you've never worried, you've never lived. But catch this, what we worry about most in life is an indication of where we trust God the least in our life. You know what the antidote to worry is? The antidote to worry is Trusting God. You know how we trust God? Trusting doesn't come with with more actions. Trusting comes with more margin. When we build margin into our life in every area of our life, it's why we practice the Sabbath. It's why we intentionally build margin into our life so that there's time in our schedule for us to stop and realize that the world keeps spinning around. It's why we have Sabbath, we're trusting God with our work. It's why we as believers have a tithe, where we build margin into our finances so that we can live generously in this world that God has placed us in, knowing just how generous he was. It's why we build margin. It's why we as believers tithe, trusting God in our finances. We remember who God is and who we are. You don't control everything. He does. We aren't God. And if we can just let God be God, that takes a whole lot of pressure off of all of us. C.S. Lewis says that the only one who can truly satisfy the human heart is the one who made it. It is good for our souls. 
It takes pressure off of us. And so we're going to be still and we're going to know and trust God. How do we do that? The psalmist tells us in verse 8, come and behold the works of the Lord. Notice that it doesn't say come and behold what work you must do. Come and behold and get into alignment in what you need to be working on in your life. No, come and behold, look and focus on the works of God. Here they are, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Nowhere in that story do I see anything about me, but it's only about what he does. And in light of that, the psalmist says, be still and know that he is God. So first, we are supposed to be still. Second, we're supposed to know God. And three, finally, we're supposed to remember that he is God. I think a problem that we have today isn't that we we don't know or we don't love God enough. I think our problem is that we don't realize how much God loves us. Listen, you may be stressed, you may be overwhelmed, you may be depressed, you may be living with anxiety, worried about your job, worried about your future, your finances, your kids, your relationships. You may be carrying around the guilt and the shame from the past. You may be carrying a present secret that you just want to keep hidden. But wherever you're at, wherever you've been, and whatever trajectory your life is on at present, you can know this, you're loved by God. Here's how I know that. The reason that I know that God loves us where we're at not based on the potential that we may or may not have, is because of what he said to his son, Jesus. This is what he says in Mark chapter one, verse 11. A voice came from heaven, a voice from our heavenly father. This voice said to Jesus, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. At the very beginning of Jesus's ministry, before Jesus performed any miracle, Before Jesus revolutionized the religious teaching of his day, his father, God, spoke to him and said, this is my boy and I love him and I'm so proud of him. Jesus hadn't done a single thing. He'd just shown up. He'd just been born. And then you're like, well, well, Brandon, that's Jesus and uh, I'm not Jesus. He's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, maybe Jesus hadn't done anything, but uh, he also, he hadn't done anything, if you know what I mean. But listen, if you are a follower of Jesus, when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. There's a whole lot of theology here. But when you trust Jesus, when you say yes to Jesus changing your life, you were fully justified in God's eyes because his death covered what should have been your death. It's this theological idea called substitutionary atonement. And what it means is when God spoke over Jesus, this is my beloved son, he speaks that over you. Doesn't mean I'm perfect, doesn't mean you're perfect, but that we get everything right from then on out. What it does mean is that he loves you. Can I just tell you, he loves you. Wherever you're at, we gotta learn and know just how much. If we're gonna experience a soul detox, if we're gonna experience this refreshing, if we are going to find rest for our soul, we've gotta find our identity in Christ. We've gotta start seeing ourselves like Jesus does. Gotta be still, living our life not in a hurry, but to choose the activities in our life, the moments in our life where we just allow ourselves to calm down, to know and to remember the truth of God, to trust God and let God be God. Uh, Please don't hear me saying at any point today that I just want you to put on headphones and listen to worship music and pretend you can't hear everything caving in all around you. I'm not suggesting that when your marriage is falling apart, you just need to thank God for being on the throne. What I am saying is, 
Jesus is inviting us to pause long enough to find our peace in our Savior, not our circumstances. To pause and rest long enough in our identity, in our Savior, not in the season of life that we're walking through. And today, as we kick off this series, I want to invite you into this soul detox, this way of living like Jesus, where you're gonna find rest and health and happiness. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father, we are at times overwhelmed in life, but I pray that we would be overwhelmed by your goodness and your kindness today. Jesus, would you so work and so move in our life that we would find the rest that our souls and our hearts so desperately need. God, would we today stop living in the hurry and the, the rush and the busy. God, may we lay down our overwhelm, trusting that you love us and that you invite us into this unhurried, rhythm, unburdened rhythm that you call the good life. Today, Jesus, would we trust you as we just slow down. In Jesus' name, amen.